the gray wolf, Canis lupus. For those of us living around the Great Lakes, the timber wolf. A creature that conjures up strong feelings, respect and reverence in some, hate and fear in others. Not long ago, wolves were hunted for bounty, but are now managed and protected by state and federal laws in the United States. Wolves are members of the canid family, which includes wild and domestic dogs, coyotes, and foxes. They vary in size. The gray wolf is the largest wild canine in the world. Only a few breeds of domestic dog are larger. Some people may confuse domestic dogs like German Shepherds or Malamutes with wolves. One reason it is difficult to distinguish between these animals is that they are all from the same genus, Canis. People sometimes mistake coyotes and wolf dog hybrids for wolves. A full grown coyote weighs about 30 pounds and is the size of a Springer Spaniel. Coyotes are common in the upper Midwest, including the North, and are even found in the suburbs of some large cities. Wolf dog hybrids can easily be the size of a wild wolf, but may act more like a dog. Gray wolves in Canada and Alaska can weigh over 100 pounds. Most wolves living in the Great Lakes area are smaller and weigh between 60 and 90 pounds, about the size of a Labrador retriever. The largest wolf captured in Wisconsin was a 108-pound male. The largest in Michigan, a 114-pound male. Wolves also vary in color. They can be pure white, jet black, or a variety of shades in between. Most of the wolves in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan are a mottled gray and brown. Gray wolves are found in North America, Europe, and Asia, inhabiting forests, prairies, deserts, and tundra. Scientists recognize several subspecies of gray wolves. For example, the Arctic wolf of the northern tundra and the Mexican gray wolf, or lobo, of Mexico and the American Southwest. Wolves share and interact with other animals, plants, and non-living parts of their surroundings. Together they form an ecosystem. Wolves are the top or apex predator in their own environment, just as lions are to the African plain. Apex predators play a vital role in nature's balancing act, and if removed, its loss affects the entire food chain. Wolves live in family groups called packs. The pack is a dynamic, ever-changing unit that can fluctuate in size from as little as two or more than a dozen members. Typically, a pack will have one dominant adult male and female. They are called the alpha pair and are the leaders of the pack. The pack may also consist of their one-year-old offspring, called yearlings, and the pups that were born that year. Other unrelated adults may also be members of the pack. Some wolves live as loners, but the pack is the primary functional unit in wolf society. Survival of the pack revolves around finding enough to eat and drink, defending a territory from other packs, and raising offspring. Each member is important to the pack's success, and the pack is important to the survival of the individual. The survival strategy of the pack is a delicate balance of cooperation and competition. Cooperation to produce a successful hunt while competing for enough food and the chance to breed. Wolves are meat eaters. Their primary prey is large hooved mammals such as moose, elk, caribou, muskox, and deer. Their diet also consists of smaller mammals such as beaver and rabbits. But because they're opportunistic, they'll catch and eat whatever is available to them, including grouse, ducks, mice, insects, and vegetable materials such as berries. In the upper Great Lakes, their diet consists mostly of deer, beaver, and snowshoe hare. Surprisingly, a Michigan yearling that was hit by a car was found to have a stomach full of grasshoppers. Wolves become sexually mature at two, breeding from January to February. In many packs, only the alpha male and female breed. The pack prepares for the birth of the new pups by finding or digging a den. It's usually underground in a heavily forested area, but sometimes they'll use hollow logs, caves, or abandoned beaver lodges. After little more than a two-month pregnancy, 
the female gives birth in her den to a litter, typically five or six pups. The pups are born blind, deaf, and helpless, and remain in or around the den for six weeks. During this time, the yearlings and the other adults bring food back for the mother, who remains in the den to nurse her pups. After the pups are weaned, the female joins the pack in search of food, but the pups are seldom left alone. An adult or yearling wolf frequently stays behind to care for them. Once the pups are on a meat diet at about eight weeks old, the pack moves them during the summer from the den to areas known as home or rendezvous sites. Here, food is brought to the pups sometimes from long distances. While hunting, it is not uncommon for pack members to gorge themselves on 15 to 20 pounds of meat, then regurgitate portions of it for the pups when they return. Come fall, the pups are old enough to keep up with the pack and the home sites are abandoned. Each pack defends its territory from other packs. Territories vary in size in the upper Midwest, but are usually between 20 to 100 square miles, with the average being about 70. That's about the size of a city with a population of 200,000 people. The Alpha Pair excludes competing wolf packs by regular patrols and scent marking of their territorial boundaries. Intruding wolves that cross those boundaries may be chased off or even killed. Although wolves can live close to humans, they prefer to live in sparsely populated areas. Lone wolves that leave their packs in search of their own territory and a mate are called dispersers. Usually these are yearlings or young adults, about two years old. Dispersing wolves can sometimes travel great distances. One wolf was radio collared in the western Upper Peninsula in Michigan near Ironwood and made it all the way to northern Missouri, a direct route of 470 miles. But it's not always a one-way journey. In another instance, an adult female from central Minnesota traveled east to Green Bay and as far south as Portage, Wisconsin, before returning to Minnesota. Our perception of wolves today has been shaped by our ancestors' history with them. Early European settlers brought with them a fear and hatred of wolves. In New England, wolves were eliminated during the 1800s. As settlers pushed west, they continued to kill off wolves and other predators. On the Great Plains, hunters wiped out the buffalo then turned on the wolves. Cattle and sheep ranchers in the West used guns, traps, and poison. Many states offered rewards or bounties, and the federal government killed wolves as part of its predator control programs. By the early 1900s, bounty hunters and others had nearly eliminated wolves from the lower 48 states. Despite being killed in great numbers, a small pocket of the large Canadian wolf population was able to survive into the mid-1900s in the forested region around Lake Superior. But by 1960, no breeding wolves had been documented in Upper Michigan or Wisconsin. At the time, northeastern Minnesota was the only place in the region with a breeding population of wolves several hundred strong. In 1973, the federal government created the Endangered Species Act and the future of the wolf in the United States reached a turning point. Recognizing that the wolf was in immediate threat of becoming extinct, it was placed on the endangered species list in 1974, the first animal in the lower 48 states to be placed on that list. With the protection of the Endangered Species Act, the Minnesota wolf population began to expand. By the mid-1970s, a pack was discovered on the Minnesota-Wisconsin border. This was the beginning of the wolf's natural return to Wisconsin and Michigan's Upper Peninsula. At the same time, a man-made reintroduction was underway in Michigan. Scientists released a pack of four wolves from Minnesota into the forest of the Upper Peninsula. And while the natural expansion of the wolf's range was increasing, this effort failed. Within eight months, all the wolves died after encounters with people. This was the only attempt biologists made to reintroduce the wolf into the upper Great Lakes region. Today, due to the Endangered Species Act, public education, and a greater understanding of the species, the wolf population is increasing. The more we learn about wolves and their coexistence with people, the more likely wolves will be accepted and remain an integral part of the natural landscape. Biologists began studying wolves shortly after the turn of the century. 
In the 1950s and 60s, scientists pioneered innovative ways to study them using airplanes and radio collars to observe and track them from a distance. This has revolutionized our understanding of wolves. Today, radio collars, some aided by satellite, are used to study wolves all over the world. But before biologists could track wolves using radio collars, they first had to learn where the wolves lived. In the winter of 1979 and 1980, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, in cooperation with the U.S. Forest Service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the states of Michigan and Minnesota, began searching Wisconsin's Northwoods for signs of wolves. We're checking out this area through this alder thicket and into the young aspen stand on the other side where uh, there was some pup activity too. About a week ago, I had uh, two pups that howled at me from this spot, so I think this might be a good potential area for catching a wolf. So we'll probably set a trap near the edge of where the alder thicket starts. After locating the wolves and studying their movements, biologists returned during the spring and summer months to trap and place radio collars on them. This helps scientists obtain a precise count of the number of wolves. Biologists use a variety of live traps to capture wolves and check them daily or even twice a day during hot weather. After the wolf is caught, it's tranquilized and fitted with a radio collar that emits a silent signal on a unique frequency. Scientists also weigh and measure the wolf and take blood samples to assess its health. After collaring, wolves are released very close to the capture site to minimize the chance of moving it outside of its territory and into the area of a neighboring pack. To keep track of individual wolves after collaring, biologists assign it a number. Sometimes the wolf is even given a nickname. One pup called Big Al the Little Gal was followed for more than two years before the batteries in the collar gave out. Another wolf from the UP number 3301 was captured and collared three times. It provided biologists with seven years worth of information. Using a receiver with an antenna, scientists pick up and home in on radio signals emitted by the caller. They can then track the wolf on foot from an automobile or airplane or even with the help of satellites. Each time the wolf is located, the biologist marks the location on a map by using GPS or Global Positioning System technology. This is a system using satellites, computers, and receivers to determine latitude and longitude locations. During the three to five year life of the radio collar, biologists will try to locate the wolf about twice a week. By tracking one collared wolf in winter, researchers can spot other wolves who are conspicuous against the snow traveling with the collared animal. Because of this, only one wolf per pack needs to be collared. Since 1979, scientists in Wisconsin have collared 3 to 18 wolves each year. Michigan wolf biologists have collared 5 to 20 wolves a year since 1991. Wolves are susceptible to disease, starvation, accidents, and the actions of humans. Crucial to wolf survival is spacious habitat. Remote areas provide wolves with enough space to find enough food, raise young, and have some protection from people who could do them harm. Attitudes about the wolf are changing with the help of organizations such as the Timberwolf Alliance, the Wildlife Science Center, the U.S. Forest Service, and the Michigan and Wisconsin Departments of Natural Resources. With their help, the wolf has reestablished traditional territories in the rugged landscape surrounding Lake Superior. Populations have reached federal and state goals to the point where wolves are no longer in imminent danger of extinction. And because of this, wolves have been reclassified to a less protected status. The key to the wolf's survival lies in our understanding of its place in the world. The wolf can't be judged solely by human standards, but must be accepted as an essential component of the northern forest ecosystem. We can all be a part of this great success story in the upper Midwest. The story of bringing a species back from the brink of extinction and ensuring the wolf's survival for future generations.